Okay, here we go with part two of DNA technologies. In part one, I talked about restriction enzymes, gel electrophoresis, polymerase chain reaction, and DNA fingerprinting. And as we'll see, some of those technologies are going to carry over to part two as well. So here I'll talk about, as I have here, recombinant DNA technology, genetic engineering, and that will also include gene therapy. So when we are talking about genetic engineering, we are actually changing the genetic information for whatever species we are dealing with. So in the picture that we're taking a look at here, it's plants that we can be genetically modifying, and we have done a lot of that. It's animals that we can genetically modify, microorganisms, bacteria that we can genetically modify, and when we get on to gene therapy, We'll also talk about humans and the potential for genetically modifying humans as well. So this word here, recombinant, is really referring to this. Recombining or joining together, splicing is the same as joining together the DNA that's coming from two different, well, it depends. It can be two different individuals that are members of the same species, or in fact, it can be joining together the DNA that comes from two different species. Not only different species, they can be from completely different kingdoms of living organisms. So huge, huge potential, and uh, this is more or less how it is taking place with the recombinant DNA and how to actually recombine them. So think of it this way for this picture. Um, molecule A will say that this is the DNA, which is coming from one individual or species, and our molecule B is the DNA that's coming from a completely different individual or species. So what you need to do, first of all, <clears throat> is take the DNA and you cut them with exactly the same restriction enzyme. So here the restriction enzyme that it shows is something that is BAMH1. So this is a restriction enzyme that is going to identify this particular set space sequence, so the GGATCC. And then it's going to make a cut. And in the case of this cut, it is a staggered cut. So the cut is going to be between the two Gs. And this would be the staggered cut. Again, the same thing with both of these, molecule A and molecule B. And then that what, what it generates are these overhanging sticky ends. And they are sticky ends because single-stranded bases don't like to be single-stranded they like to attach to well complementary bases. So it just so happens that because we cut both A and B with the same, and again, that's why it is key that it needs to be the same restriction enzyme, they have the same complementary sticky ends. So mix them together and they adhere together, they form hydrogen bonds in between those sticky ends. We do need to seal off the backbone as well between the adjacent phosphates. So we did come across this DNA ligase before. It is an enzyme. It's an enzyme that you have in your cells. It's necessary for joining together those Okazaki fragments with DNA replication. And now it's a technology because we're using it to join together these two sections of DNA. And we form now this bond that we do see. So let me just go back there. We form this bond that we see right here using the DNA ligase. And now what we have done is we have recombined or combined together the DNA from two different sources. And this is now what is referred to as recombinant DNA. So this is the sort of thing that is done all the time and very, very simple and straightforward to do. So we'll start with this one. This is the one that they started to do way back in the, um, the 1970s, the latter part of the 1970s. This does go back to the earlier part of the 1970s, by the way, and it was so uh, controversial when it did first come out and they discovered that they could do that sort of thing join together the DNA from different organisms that there was a moratorium on recombinant DNA technology. So they've done a lot of this, um, again, starting in the 1970s, late 1970s. So what we have here is a bacterial cell at the upper left-hand side. And recall that bacterial have circular chromosomes. So this is the large circular bacterial chromosome. They also have a smaller circular chromosome or smaller sections of DNA which are called the bacterial plasmids. And quite often these plasmids, uh, plasmids, by the way, they do have on them 
uh, genes for antibiotic resistance. So if we do have a bacteria that is resistant to a particular bacteria, for example, penicillin that we might be using, then that gene that allows it to be resistant to that particular antibiotic, they're usually housed on these bacterial plasmids. And uh, these bacterial plasmids, it can also kind of be exchanged between different bacteria. So we can have some bacteria that are not resistant to an antibiotic, and all of a sudden, this plasmid is shared from other bacteria that are resistant to it, and then new bacteria will become resistant to that particular antibiotic. Anyway, what we're interested in retrieving from the bacteria is that plasmid. So um, if we take the bacteria and if we rupture the cell membrane around the outside, now we want to separate out these chromosomes. This one here is big, plasmids are small. So if we do gel electrophoresis, put our DNA at the top, then the big, large bacterial chromosome that's going to end up up here. The smaller ones are going to zip through the gel, and now we just need to retrieve that out of the gel. So this is now our DNA bacterial plasmid, and we're going to cut it with a restriction enzyme. So that restriction enzyme, as we just saw, it's going to generate these overhanging sticky ends. Now we're going to take, yes, a human chromosome section of DNA, and they're using as the example here the insulin gene. And of course, we talked a lot about insulin, that hormone that is responsible, or the main hormone responsible for blood glucose regulation. And from that human chromosome, we're going to retrieve that gene by cutting it with the same restriction enzyme that was used to cut the bacterial plasma. So we retrieve that human gene, whether it's insulin or whatever other gene we're interested in. And now we have, because it was cut with the same restriction enzyme as the bacterial plasma, they have exactly the same overhanging complementary sticky ends. So you mix them together, they stick, they adhere, throw in some DNA ligase, and now what we have created is our recombinant plasma made up of our bacterial DNA and our human gene. So now what are we going to do with this plasmid? <clears throat> well, we're going to take that plasmid, so that would be right in the middle here. This is our recombinant plasmid. We're going to take that plasmid, we're going to put it back into some bacterial cells. So now this bacteria has the plasmid, but not only that, it has the human gene, the human insulin gene. Now we're just going to feed these bacteria, allow them to grow, reproduce, and some bacteria can divide very, very quickly, like every 20 minutes. So in a very short period of time, what you have is a whole bunch of bacteria, like we're talking millions upon millions of bacteria, that are all clones of each other. They're all genetically identical, and more important, what they all do have is they have this human gene, which is for insulin. Bacteria, by the way, have absolutely no use for this insulin gene in any way whatsoever, but they will go ahead and they will read that gene. It'll be transcribed, it'll be translated, and the human insulin protein will be produced. Now, all we need to do is retrieve that insulin protein, and that, in fact, is where people that are diabetic, that is where they now get their insulin from, from recombinant bacteria that are making the insulin protein for those people. So what we see in this picture down at the bottom here, so this kind of just walks us through the process that's involved again, but various different applications, and of course we'll chat about a few of them. Here it has a growth hormone, so people that have dwarfism, this is where they get their growth hormone from as well. Recombinant bacteria that we have tricked into making this protein for us that we then use for therapeutic purposes. It's not just in humans, though. We can genetically modify bacteria. We can genetically modify plants that we have done a lot of, as we'll see. So it's kind of wide open in terms of what we can tweak. Keep in mind, every single living organism that we have discovered so far, bacteria, plants, animals, fungi, protists, archaea, they all use exactly the same genetic information, which is DNA, so it's quite easy using this technology to combine the DNA from whatever different sources we choose. So again, let's just take a look at what some of these applications are. 
So in terms of producing these useful products for humans, a lot of it does have to do with medical treatment. So yeah, insulin for people that are diabetic, this is where they do get their insulin from. People that have blood clotting disorders, various different kinds of hemophilia, hemophilia A, hemophilia B, it's clotting factors that they don't have a gene, a functional gene for making these clotting factors. Now it's bacteria that make it for these people. Uh, growth hormone, we already saw that one. This one here, erythropoietin, people that have kidney disease quite often can't produce this EPO, which is necessary for stimulating bone marrow to produce red blood cells and a whole bunch of other human proteins that lead to disease, that lead to deficiencies. And this is the way that they are produced using recombinant bacteria. <clears throat> So let's uh, bump it up a little bit. So instead of just talking about single-celled organisms, bacteria that are prokaryotic cells, let's talk about um, the more complex eukaryotic cells, starting with plants, a little bit on animals, and then eventually to humans as well. So why would we want to genetically modify plants, referred to as genetically modified organisms? Many, many different goals. So we might want to increase the expression of some genes. So let's say that there is a gene which is for growth. Maybe we want the, grow, the plant to grow faster or to grow larger. So we can insert more copies of that particular gene or we can increase the promoter activity for that particular gene. We can maybe um, insert a different gene that's a little bit better or maybe we can take that gene and tweak it a little bit to in fact make it even better and then reinsert it back into the plant. And we can also add, and this is really what has been done a lot, we can add beneficial genes or what we think are beneficial genes creating transgenic species because they would be coming from other species then, whether it's a plant or whether it's something else. So this has been really big in plants in terms of introducing genes, allowing them to be resistant to pesticides that might be sprayed on the crops or herbicides. Um, cold resistance, heat resistance, bumping up the protein content or the vitamin content like vitamin A, all of those are possibilities. It is a little bit more challenging with plants because plants do have a cell wall and you need to get the DNA through the cell wall. So unbelievably, they actually can use a gun, which is called a gene gun. So it use, uh, met use metal particles, tungsten or gold that has DNA coated on the outside and they physically shoot it through the cell wall and really hope that it's going to be introduced into a location within the chromosome of the plant cell. And then it will be expressed and that plant will have the new trait. What's more common though is to use this bacteria here. It's called agrobacterium. And it is a bacteria that specifically does infect cells. And what it does is it introduces DNA into the cells. So what they need to do then is just take the plasmid, which does have the gene of interest, which is showing here in red, which might be a gene for example, cold resistance, get it into the agrobacterium, just allow the agrobacterium to do what it normally does, which infects this plant cell, introduce the gene. And now we just need to take a look at all those plant cells and pick the one which does in fact express that new trait and grow it as a plant. And this is now our genetically modified plant that we do have. So it's been done for many, many different things at this point. <coughs> so here are some of the, again, some of the applications. Um, most definitely herbicide and pesticide resistance. So BT toxin, this is kind of a big one, comes from the soil bacterium bacillus. So it's isolated from the soil bacterium, introduced into the agrobacterium, allowed to infect the plants, and then the plants now have their resistance to things like the gypsy moth and the cotton boa. Another huge one here, uh, Roundup, is a herbicide, which is actually produced by this multinational company, Monsanto. Uh, Roundup ready crops include these ones here and others as well, but soy, canola, and corn. They have been gen genetically modified to be resistant to this particular herbicide. So now you spray the herbicide on the crop, it kills all of the weeds, but it allows these to survive because they have been genetically modified to have a gene allowing them to resist that particular herbicide. So many, many crops that we grow in North America 
they had been genetically modified specifically for this purpose. Other ones, again, these have been tried for sure. So this one here, golden rice, is to bump up the content of vitamin A that you find in rice. And really it's sort of wide open in terms of what you can do in terms of plants. So whether it's uh, like I have here for the color, the taste, um, tolerance for heat and cold and saline salt conditions, all kinds of different possibilities in terms of genetically modifying plants. Not quite as many examples in animals, a little bit more difficult to do in some ways in animals. Remember that in plants, there's the Mary stem region, some of those cells that remain totipotent. But to do this with animals, um, really the only totipotent cells are the zygotes or after a few cell divisions from the point of the zygote. <clears throat> so now you need to introduce that DNA into the zygote. So yes, this has been done. So Atlantic salmon, and this in fact has been approved for sale in Canada, Atlantic salmon, and it just has a gene which increases the growth rate for those salmon, so they grow faster than normal salmon do. Genetically modified pigs, so that of Ontario, Enviro pig, genetically modified, so there's less uh, phosphorus that they're releasing through their urine and their feces. And uh, some work done on this as well. Xenotransplantation is taking the um, <clears throat> organ from one species and transplanting it into another one, that is xenotransplantation. So the idea here is to take organs from another species that have organs of a similar size, tweak those cells a little bit so they look a little bit more like human cells so we can actually take pig organs and transplant them into humans that do need an organ for replacement so that is called xenotransplantation and as you can imagine there are fairly significant societal issues related to this sort of thing so yes there are some problems but many of these problems have been overcome so when you do put that gene into the plant for example or the animal so the question is always well is it going to work so is it going to be expressed is it going to be read is the cell going to make the rna is it going to make the protein is it going to somehow interfere with some other genes that are already in that cell you don't want that and when the cell divides is it going to be passed on to the other cells as well which of course you also want. So again, I did mention societal issues that I won't talk too much about here, but certainly some would argue that it's not a natural process, taking the DNA from one species, putting it into another one. There certainly were some other big concerns, especially in uh, Europe and the European Union, um, environmental concerns and healthcare and medical concerns. And there was um, kind of a moratorium on the growth of genetically modified crops and the selling of genetically modified crops in Europe for a long period of time. But eventually they kind of realized after decades that, well, there really weren't any environmental concerns to be concerned about, or there weren't any healthcare or medical concerns. So now that's opening up a little bit in Europe as well. It has been for a long time in North America, but sort of the recognition globally now that there don't really seem to be any of these concerns that people were worried about early on in the 1980s, even in the 1990s, in terms of the genetically modified crops in particular. So finally, let's go on to genetically modifying humans, which is specifically referred to as gene therapy now. So having bacteria make insulin or make some other sort of therapeutic protein it's nice because it provides a treatment, but unfortunately it's not a cure. So the problem really is with the genetic information. So the idea is, can't we just fix that genetic information in that person that is diabetic or that person that has hemophilia? So let's just take the therapeutic gene, let's get it into that person's cell so they can make the therapeutic protein themselves. And now we don't just have a treatment, now we actually have a cure. <clears throat> so yes, an application of DNA technology where we're actually trying to reprogram those cells for a critical genetic coding error. They don't have the correct instructions in the DNA for making a vitally important protein. So yeah, this is why there was such a huge drive is it's not just a treatment. 
So if it's someone that's diabetic, they no longer have to prick their finger all the time to check their blood glucose. They no longer have to inject the perfect amount of insulin to regulate their blood glucose. Now their body is going to naturally do all of this again, just like in someone that is non-diabetic. So yes, it corrects the problem at the source, which is the DNA, the defect and mutation to the DNA. So there has been some success so early on in the 1990s, there was some success with uh, something referred to as severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome, some success with some other ones, and definitely most of the drive here is for what are referred to as single gene disorders. It's one single gene that there is a problem with. So that includes many of which we talk about. Cystic fibrosis is a single gene disorder. <clears throat> Muscular dystrophy, a single gene disorder. Familial hypercholesterolemia, a single gene disorder, hemophilia A, hemophilia B, many, many other ones. Um, diabetes, we did say that there are many different genes that could be responsible for that one, different mutations. So that one may not be just a single gene disorder, but most of the work has been done taking a look at these so-called single gene disorders. <clears throat> so I'll give a few um, an example here and take a look at a few slides that are referring to hemophilia. I think this one is specifically hemophilia B where they're not making that particular clotting factor. So someone that has a hemophilia, um, their blood is unable to clot properly, so they do end up with a bleeding disorder, different severities, but they're unable to seal off blood vessels properly. So there certainly are treatments and those are the factors, the blood clotting factors that are produced by genetically modified bacteria in order to use them as a treatment. But if we take a look at these graphs, so um, hemostasis is just regulating the amount of it within the blood and the amount of the clotting factor in the blood. And we can see that it's sort of going up and down and all over the place. In other words, there isn't really um, an ideal amount consistently within their blood. So if we could do gene therapy, then notice that we do have a consistent level the clotting factor. So now, as they've labeled here, it's a cure. So here, it's a treatment, kind of works, it's okay, but it's not a cure. So the idea is we want to somehow fix the problem at the source, which is the, the DNA. So how do we go ahead and do this? So find that correct gene, relatively straightforward. We have most of these genes now since they completed the Human Genome Project. So that's not all that terribly difficult. Delivering the gene, this is a big, big problem. Getting the gene and getting it safely into the cell, into the correct cell, into the target cell, and then getting it to actually function properly. Get that gene to be read, the protein to be, to be produced, not only being expressed, but being expressed through the lifetime for that person. So it is truly a cure that they're getting and not just a treatment. So this slide will take us through a couple of different uh, methods. So the way to get the gene into the cells, there are various different what we call vectors or vehicles. The most common one though is to use a virus. So this is showing a virus right here. So many different viruses that they have tried um, adenoviruses, adeno-associated viruses, even the HIV virus responsible for AIDS, they've tried that one for some forms of gene therapy. So why use viruses? Because what they do is infect cells and introduce their DNA, and that's why they use that as the delivery system, or yes, as they have here, the delivery vector or delivery vehicle. So what do you do? You take the therapeutic gene like for hemophilia. You get that therapeutic gene into the virus, and then you just allow the virus to do what it naturally does, which is infect the cells. So this is one way to do it, the direct delivery, which just means taking that recombinant virus now, injecting it directly into the patient, let it circulate around, find the cells, infect the cells, and introduce that therapeutic gene. All kinds of problems with this. Huge one is as soon as you take a virus and inject it into a person, if the person has a functioning and robust immune system, it will simply attack and destroy that virus. So it's never going to deliver its cargo to the cell and it's never going to get that therapeutic gene into the cell. There are other some problems that can arise as well. 
um, the person may in fact have a immune response and a significant immune response, which can lead to some fairly serious complications. A safer way to go about doing this might be instead of injecting the virus into the person's body, actually take some cells out of that person's body, ideally stem cells that you're taking out. It also shows up here, we've chatted a little bit about um, other kinds of stem cells, um, totipotent and pluripotent stem cells, embryonic stem cells, those can also be used, created through in vitro fertilization. So here the key though is that they're outside of the body, they're in a petri dish. You can do the same thing, therapeutic gene inside a virus, let the virus infect the cells, but it's in a petri dish, it's not in the person's body. So now if something goes wrong, well, it's only in the petri dish. So now you can check and make sure everything has worked properly. And if you do have that gene that has been inserted into those cells, now you can take those genetically modified cells and put them back into the person. So much safer approach compared to the direct delivery that it has on the left-hand side. This one again just shows here um, what is going on in terms of the virus when it gets into the cell. So this one it shows as the adeno associated virus. Again, this would be the DNA. Oh, the DNA from the virus, by the way, they yank out all the nasty stuff, all the things that could cause harm to the person. So it doesn't cause any harm to the person. Still allowing the virus to infect the cells, only now it's going to have the therapeutic gene. So it's going to go into the cell deliver the cargo. Um, it doesn't have to be into the nucleus, but usually they want to get it into the nucleus. And then in the nucleus, that DNA is going to be red, and we're going to have the protein that is expressed, the protein that is made. And if it is made, and if it's continually made, then hopefully that's going to provide a cure for whatever that condition is that that particular individual does have. Um, I didn't talk about liposomes, but liposomes are another delivery system. It's just a phospholipid bilayer. So one of the problems with them is it works for small portions of DNA, but typically not larger portions. I mentioned that they yank out all of the pathogenic stuff that allows the virus to be harmful. But there is a chance that, well, in some cases, it could regain its pathogenic activity, which, of course, would not be good. Um, this was definitely a problem, as we'll see. The patient might develop an elevated immune response if that virus is injected into the person, which might mean that it's useless, or it can lead to something that's called systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And this, in fact, can end up being fatal. And that, unfortunately, was the case with some trials that they did going back to the 1990s. I thought I had another picture here. There we go. I just wanted to show you this picture here uh, before we go back to the CRISPR-Cas9 that kind of walks us through a timeline here for gene therapy. So this peak here, uh, this is kind of going through the early 1990s. So they have this one here, kind of worked for this ADA deficiency, kind of worked for the SCID or severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome. So huge, huge expectations in the mid-1990s that we were going to be able to cure pretty much any genetic condition, and then there were some problems. So one of those big problems was, well, in 1999, gene therapy was done on Jesse Gelsinger, and he did have a severe immune reaction. So it wasn't the gene therapy that ended up uh, leading to the death of Jesse, what it was was his over-immune response, but he did end up dying, and that kind of shut things down in gene therapy for many, many, many years. So things did eventually kind of build up again as they took a closer look at the vectors, started to study the immune response a little bit more. So um, over the last few years, yeah, there have been some successes, and in particular, it seems like hemophilia B, they've had a significant amount of success with gene therapy, in, their, in terms of a curing hemophilia B. So again, these technologies, they kind of go back a few decades, but let me um, finally just share with you this one here, which is only over the last decade. So we did talk about restriction enzymes already in the previous lesson on DNA technologies, and restriction enzymes are one of the mechanisms by which bacteria can protect themselves against viruses 
that might be trying to infect that bacteria. Well, this is another protective mechanism, this one here, the CRISPR-Cas9. So it was um, initially discovered, oh, I think a little over 10 years ago, uh, between uh, 2000 and 2010, but really the significance in terms of the application for this in terms of gene editing, it didn't come out until between uh, 2010 and 2015. So this CRISPR-Cas9, it is a combination of RNA and protein, and its source again is bacteria. And is, it is a bacterial mechanism, just like prescription enzymes, to protect the bacteria against viral infections. But what's really kind of interesting about this one is the CRISPR-Cas9 system seems to allow the bacteria to actually remember viruses that it's been exposed to in the, in the past. So kind of think of it as sort of like our memory cells. They remember what our immune system has been exposed to in the past. But of course, bacteria are just single cells, but they have this CRISPR-Cas9 that allows them to do something kind of similar. So recognize the viral DNA as it infiltrate, infiltrates the cell, and then what it's going to do is cut it, kind of like with the restriction enzymes, only now it actually remembers if it's been exposed to it in the past, and this is then going to disable it. So again, that virus can't take over the cell. So researchers took a look at this, and they realized that they could actually do a little bit of tweaking here. So what they can do is they can actually use the RNA, and they can adjust it, they can tweak it a little bit, to kind of dictate exactly what they want the system to recognize. So they're going to, as I have here, replace the guide RNA with specifically designed RNA that allows it to cut the DNA wherever we want, wherever we choose that DNA to be cut. So when we're using viruses as the vector for gene therapy, we don't really know where that virus is going to insert the gene, and that can be kind of a problem. If it's in the wrong place, if it's in the middle of another gene, it might lead to some problems, but now we can sort of pinpoint exactly where it is where we want this gene to be inserted. So then we're going to throw in the donor DNA. So we can cut the DNA exactly where we want it to be cut. We throw in some donor DNA, which might be for the insulin gene, and we can put it exactly where we want within that chromosome. So much, much more specific than using viruses. So yeah, it just has at the bottom here with that donor DNA. Certainly it can be used for human cells, but it's kind of open to, once again, whatever we like, anything else that has DNA, this sort of thing would work for as well. And again, societal issues related to this, if it's a societal issue when you're genetically modifying bacteria, genetically modifying plants and other animals, it certainly is going to lead to some societal issues when we're talking about genetically modifying humans as well. And this question quite often comes up just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that needs to be done or even in some cases should be done. So certainly many people I think would agree that if it is a therapeutic gene that we're introducing into someone that's going to cure them, most people would probably agree that this is something that probably should be done. But what we need to be really careful with is we don't want to mess things up and then pass that on our mistakes to the next generation. So really all of the gene therapy that they've been taking a look at so far are somatic cells. So those again are your own body cells. It's not the sperm, it's not the eggs, it's not the zygote. So it's not being passed on to the next generation. What has been kind of a big no-no is this one here, germline. So that is genetically modifying the gametes or genetically modifying the zygote. So this has been um, sort of off um, something that hasn't been a possibility or something that they've been uh, discouraging ever since they were talking about gene therapy. Um, unfortunately, it was in um, 2019, 2018, 2019, that a researcher out of China, he did genetically modify the zygote, and what he genetically modified the zygote for was protection against the 
HIV virus, which is responsible for AIDS. And huge uproar, not only with uh, researchers, other researchers in China, but around the world as well, because that was kind of a huge no-no, was germline gene therapy. So yes, this is really what the researchers um, are taking a look at is the somatic. Um, the other one, therapeutic versus enrichment. So therapeutic is you're providing a cure for some sort of disorder to fix something that is wrong. Enrichment is nothing is really wrong. It's just someone might like something to make them a little bit different, which isn't necessarily a cure. So it could be, for example, introducing a gene which would increase muscle mass. And this wouldn't necessarily be a defect related to multiple sclerosis or anything like that. It might just be that someone wants an increased muscle mass and they want a gene that would allow them to increase their muscle mass. So most people would appreciate that that is enrichment, that is not therapeutic in any way whatsoever. So again, it's really just the therapeutic aspect of the gene therapy that researchers are taking a look at right now. But once again, many, many, many societal issues that they have been discussing right now and many other societal issues that no doubt will come up in the future as well.